Plesiosaurs are one of the most iconic animals from the age of dinosaurs. They were marine reptiles with four flippers and a rudder tail. Although they were two basic body plans, with some having short necks and large heads and other having long necks with small heads, these do not represent cladistic groups, as there are a great deal of overlap with some clades having both morphs represented. They occupied a wide range of niches on Earth, and were highly successful from the early Jurassic right up until the conclusion of the Cretaceous. On Chimere, plesiosaurs have had a long and successful history well past their extinction on Earth, being a familiar sight to those living in the known world and beyond. Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. When plesiosaurs first came to Chimere nearly 200 million years ago, the seas were ruled by giant marine therapsids, which were largely unaffected by the conditions which ended the Permian Dynasty. These great predators continued their rule until the end of the first Jurassic Dynasty, when the seas were thrown into chaos and a newly harvested short-necked pliosaur, such as Pliosaurus itself, took the throne. Their tenure as apex predators lasted through the Mesozoic Dynasties until the arrival of Mosasaurs at the beginning of the Tyrant Dynasty pushed them toward the poles. Some specialized forms persisted, especially in the southern oceans around Kaishel, but with the end of the dynastic extinction, the last of the pliosaurs went extinct. From the ashes of a fallen dynasty arose new kings. The tropics were again claimed by mosasaurs, this time the descendants of small generalists once in the shadow of their giant cousins. They ran into some trouble with cetaceans and giant sharks from later harvests, but a highly derived species has since taken over the tropical oceans, the Motomazor. The colder waters of Chimere, however, are generally controlled by the Elasmosaurs. In the aftermath of the dynastic extinction, a small generalist plesiosaur, this one with a small head and a very long neck, was in the right place at the right time for an adaptive radiation. While some remained in the polar seas hunting crustaceans, cephalopods, and fish, Others went on to explore all sorts of new niches and waters. The cladistic placement of this animal is debated, but all five species in the known world are generally placed in the same genus, Thalassocolubris, or Serpent of the Abyss. Most frequently encountered of this genus is the Dicogon, or Meadow Serpent. They came to the inland sea around when it was becoming a vast seagrass meadow six million years ago, and have changed little in this time. Like other members of the genus, the meadow serpent has astonishingly powerful jaws, but the back teeth have become robust to better crack open the shells of mollusks and crustaceans, which make up a majority of their diet. On occasion they are into scavenge, usually taking a few bones they can swallow whole, but also thrashing carcasses about to break them apart into manageable portions. On rare occasion, they will hunt larger game, but this is typically only done in desperation when the preferred crustaceans and mollusks have had a bad season. They are also the only omnivorous species of plesiosaur, with seagrass making up as much as 30% of their diet. They may have started to protect their stomachs from the sharp carapaces of crabs and marine scorpions or broken ammonite shells, but they can digest it at least to a partial degree. When hunting, meadow serpents will look for and smell potential prey. Thanks to a separation of their blowholes from their olfactory organs, their sense of smell is especially potent, and long prehensile tongues help bring in particulates from the water, aiding them in seeking out potential prey to a general location. Once they are in an area where they can smell ample game, they flip over to seek visual signs. Their eyesight is quite keen, and they have significant binocular vision, but their eyes face upward, so they must flip over to see the meadow below. They might also burrow their faces in the meadows, using sensitive pads on their snout to feel and carving lines as they swim to disturb prey, but this method is generally not successful unless they have already located a hidden prey item 
or are having particular density of games, such as nesting scorpions, snapper nurseries, or mating crabs. While preferring to hunt in seagrass meadows, they will patrol the current channels and reef habitats in search of other prey. They are also quite comfortable in freshwater, and have been reported hundreds of miles into the seretic wetlands. Meadow serpents live in family groups. The leader is typically the eldest female of the matriline. Depending on food availability and predatory pressures, these families consist of hundreds of individuals, although usually they live in much smaller decentralized groups while keeping in contact with their relatives. Upwells in the summer months will bring a bounty from the polar sea. This prompts annual migrations, which is when unrelated pods gather and mate during this smorgasbord. Pups are born after nearly two years of pregnancy, and will depend upon their family until their mother's next pup is born two years later, at which point they remain with their mother for protection until they reach maturity at around eight years of age. Pups may subsist on crop milk, partially digested seafood which congeals upon contact with salt water, making it easy for the pup to catch. Both sexes can produce this, and to offset the demands of near-perpetual pregnancy, Uncles living with the pod will often take it upon themselves to feed their sisters pups and teach them how to hunt. There has long been a discrepancy noted by Chimera naturalists between the social complexity and clever behaviors witnessed when compared to the size of their brains. Despite being around 20 feet long and weighing around a ton, meadow serpents' brains are only the size of a beer can. Recent studies of specimens have led the Great Library to conclude that elasmosaurs, at least those within the genus, have among the most efficient and neuron-dense brains of any tetrapod, allowing for far greater intelligence than one might suspect from a small-brained animal. Although they have not been domesticated, several individuals have been tamed, usually young males, as females tend to be more aggressive. Another species of Thalassocolubris is the Shodima, or marine serpent. This pelagic species generally live in open waters and hunt a variety of large fish and small marine mammals. Sharks are a particularly favored target. While not nearly as fast as the competition, such as orcas and gray-white sharks, they are substantially more agile. Long necks anchor to a barrel chest, and they can twist and turn about with blinding speed. Although they prefer targeting prey they can swallow whole, they will strike game against the surface to break it into more manageable pieces if the need arises. They are generalist predators, willing to try out anything they think they can catch. Unfortunately, this includes Chimeran swimmers. Marine serpents rarely travel in the inland sea, but they do encounter sailors in the open ocean, and a few individuals have learned that ships are often capable of having sailors being picked off from the deck. These man-eaters are rare, but they can be hauntingly proficient and prolific killers, and the few times this has extended to a whole pod can result in an entire ship being picked off in a matter of minutes. Largest of the genus is the mighty Cadanook, Serpent of the Abyss. This is a hunter of squid and krakens. Their red hide masks them in the lightless abyss in which they hunt. As even their keen eyes cannot see at this depth, they rely upon scent to find the general location of prey and their sensitive pads along their jawline to hone in. They supplanted the last pliosaurs in this niche, but now must contend with beaked whales in the recently harvest cachalots. In response, the Cadanook and cachalot have been in a bit of an arms race for size, and while the cachalot is larger and generally more prolific, the Cadanook requires less food given their slower metabolism. Cadanook also generally target larger cephalopods, grappling even the multi-ton horned kraken. While killing krakens is sometimes done by grabbing hold and shredding them by great lateral arcs of their 60-foot necks, when this is not enough, they will grab hold, enduring the kraken's retaliation with their thick skin and blubber as they bring them to the surface. A few Akanuk whalers have been treated to the spectacle of a Kadanuk breaking the waves, lifting their prize 20 meters out of the water, and smashing it against the surface for a devastating kill. 
Kadunuk have no regard for Chimerans and do not treat them as a threat, yet are still universally feared and revered. Kadunuk are generally solitary hunters, but will often live in small pods. Pups cannot endure the depths as they cannot hold their breath for the hour or more that it can take to catch sufficient prey, so having an adult watch over the young can be of great benefit, as there are many predators who would not dare challenge an adult, but would readily feed upon the six-meter pups. Motomazor are a threat in warmer waters, and Megalodon hunt them wherever they are found. Yet perhaps the greatest threat to young Kadanuk is the fourth species of Thalassocolubris. The Xanatel. Whaler or Corpse Serpent. It seems it did not take long after the adaptive radiation of Thalassocolubris for one species to take the occasional sampling of large game to specialization. The Xanatel readily tackle marine mammals up to a ton, preferring to ambush them from below, latch on, and strike them against the surface until the prey can be swallowed in manageable parts. They are well documented in tackling prey much larger than themselves, however, with pods mobbing cetaceans like diver cachalot, killer cachalot, orcas, and beaked whales. When hunting this sort of game, they strike in unison, with most latching onto fins and flukes, while the leader, typically the matriarch or eldest male of the pod, will bite the blowhole. With their long necks able to absorb any kinetic strain, the thick hide, blubber, and osteoderms allowing them to endure considerable punishment, the pod can relax as the prey exhausts itself, with their long fangs provoking substantial blood loss. Once the prey drowns, the serpents quickly tuck in, twisting open the body and targeting the organs before the whaler sharks or motomazor can arrive to take over. Although they themselves are prey to Megalodon and the great tropical mosasaurs, so do not hold the rank of apex predator, Xanatel are often considered rulers of the great polar seas, even as the mighty grandfather whale or killer cachalot is on the menu. The ranges of Xanatel and Motomazor have minimal intersection, and Megalodon are not terribly common in their colder waters outside of following migrating whales in the summer months. The Xanatel and Mokrine, or polar blackfish, have a long-standing and iconic rivalry. They are well documented to kill one another on sight if the opportunity presents itself. While the Xanatel has the advantage in duels, Mokrine are more intelligent and faster swimmers, and even a pair of them can reliably overwhelm a lone corpse serpent. Xanatel are of higher trophic level as they are predators of Mokrim, and the killer whales only seek to kill rival or predator species, but they still compete for the same prey and their penchant for attacking one another has inspired countless folklore stories of ancient rivalries. Juveniles of the genus Thalassocolubris share a number of traits, and indeed look much more alike than they do as adults. Juvenile traits of the genus include proportionally larger fins, shorter necks, and more gracile bodies. Their heads are much larger, as are their eyes. The head shape is their most divergent trait, with minimal jaw muscles, and the large eyes face out instead of up, giving them a far wider field of vision, but also no stereostopic vision, a trait believed to be favored in detecting predators, which are less of an issue as adults. A fifth species of Thalassocolubris is found in perhaps a surprising location, the highland Great Lakes of Picardia. These interconnected lakes, many of which are several hundred square miles with an average depth of 500 feet, support a highly diverse and unique ecosystem. The Watigoga is the top predator of these lakes, competing with several large fish and a few terrestrial predators on shore, although all defer to the occasional Kurujaku, which comes its way up river during the rainy season, and might even end up trapped if it grows too large to return downstream. The great salmonid Dabalajada has been using the Great Lakes as a spawning ground for millions of years, and many predators gather to feast along its path. It is believed that a population of Thalassocolubris may have followed these fish upstream, similar to Kurujaku, and then gotten trapped in the lake. As there are several points of waterfalls from the river to the sea, it must have been a particularly high flood year for their ancestors to chase the salmon upstream. 
Whatever their origins, they have thrived in this new context with minimal competition. Perhaps due to the constrained habitat, they are a neotenic species similar to the Urutaku, which is their terrestrial counterpart. This neoteny, or retention of juvenile traits, makes them look quite distinct from adults of related species, and has led to them having a unique genus when they were first discovered. Their teeth are also quite distinct, being flatter blades that better at cutting than grasping. They are notorious generalist predators, capable of short crawls on shore, long enough to grab unsuspecting terrestrial prey and drag them back into the water. Their short jaws with massive protruding muscles gives them one of the strongest bites in Chimere, which they put to good use in grabbing and shaking about struggling prey. While Thalassocolubris is the most common genus, and have competed the small generalists in the known world before they arrived, there are two other elasmosaurs in the known world which came from the north. Although these species both have short necks, they are generally much closer to the likes of Elasmosaurus than they are to the Pliosaurs they might resemble. The largest species is called the Jacogan by the Kenterim who meet them. They are indigenous to the North Polar Sea, but a small temperate species which occupies a similar niche to orcas, hunting small and medium fish and the occasional marine therapsid in family groups. While they have not established a significant population, and there have been many regional extinctions, they are more regularly spotted by kentering fishermen who harvest in the northern seas. Little is known of their behavior, and being so far from home might impact their habits, but they are generally regarded as surprisingly gentle creatures despite a frightening appearance. Last and most recent, and by far the most successful elasmosaur, is the Grakogan. These little fish specialists are among the most agile swimmers of the inland sea, being regarded as nearly impossible to catch by spear and bow fishers. Rather than living in tightly knit pods, Grakogan live in vast, loosely connected groups. Males have a tall display fin. They are also quite coordinated in social hunts, which enables this single species to endanger or outcompete the many dolphins, penguins, and small mosasaurs occupying this niche in the inland sea. They are a menace to fishermen, letting nets herd fish then striking before they can be drawn in. Like the Watigoga, their teeth are bladed rather than pegs, with serrated edges that are well recorded to deal horrid wounds to fishermen caught in the water during an attack. They are quite aggressive, happily mobbing predators or large herbivores many times their size and inflicting countless little wounds while being infuriatingly difficult to fend off. Interestingly, the meadow and corpse serpent are their main predators, being the only hunters in the area agile enough to regularly catch them, although the dire bonito can take them out by virtue of sheer speed. Elasmosaurs are a frequent inclusion in Chimeran folklore. Their depictions vary, being cunning tricksters and brutal villains to helpful guides and wise sages, but they are universally recognized as significant to any peoples close to water. The first children seem to have been particularly enamored with their features, striking an unnervingly human visage from the front thanks to their binocular vision, and elasmosaurs are often incorporated in homunculi. The crocodile god Bokushai, called Olikidu by the Picardiant, is believed to have been one of the last Class III homunculi, and while he is called the crocodile god, he is usually shown with the head of a Xanatel or Watigoga. In Picardian folklore, Olikidu, and by extension the Watigoga of the Highlands, is seen as the nemesis of the trickster Indrakai. The trickster and the puppet master are always seen in opposite sides, and it is the only time where Indrakai is always shown in a heroic context. He will cause trickery and despair in his own time, but when faced with his nemesis, the Firebird is the champion of mortals. As generalist predators who hunt an astonishingly wide range of prey in a highly diverse set of niches, from the abyss and highland lakes to seagrass meadows, freshwater marshes, and open ocean, the lasso colubris and plesiosaurs in general have proven themselves to be an ecological force to be reckoned with, serpents to be feared and revered. While they might not be the top predators, elasmosaurs are one of the most successful and iconic beasts in this strange and dangerous world. 
Thank you so much to Stonebone for sponsoring this episode. As many of you know, this was an episode I've been waiting to make since January, but I know their importance and I knew I would need to make a lot of artwork and dedicate many hours to study, so I very much appreciate Stonebone for providing me the means to devote that time. Shout out to my Patreon patrons for your support, which has allowed me to continue making these episodes. I also thank you for watching this. A few people have asked, and yes, this channel is indeed monetized. So the ads you watch do and make <clears throat> so the ads you watch do make up a good bit of my paycheck, and I deeply appreciate you for that. Thanks again for watching, and cheers again to Stonebone for sponsoring this episode. See you all next week. Cheers, folks. Thank <laughs> you.